students, self-efficacy of first generation compared to second generation college students. Judges, for your records, Carly is participant number 30. Carly, you are on the clock. Seven minute presentation. Okay, give me one second. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, then I, I won't. I won't start the clock yet. Yeah, don't because like I gotta figure out how to put it. Yeah. Give me one second. I'm sorry. I forgot how to do it. It's preview. No. Maddie, if you go to the slideshow menu and start the show, I think that's what you're trying to do. Oh, yeah, that's what I forgot. I guess I'm just losing my mind right now. I'm sorry. That, I'm, that's okay. I'm a little nervous. That's all right. You're doing great. It'll be no fine. No pressure. Okay, um, I'm ready. Okay. Hi, good morning, good. everyone. My name is Carly Broussard, and my study is the relationship between test anxiety and GPA in college students. This is my abstract. If you guys care to read it, you guys can. I'll leave it on here for a second. It's just discussing like my study and like everything that I had to do in it and stuff and the statistics part. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Does test anxiety impact GPA? Do lower classmen have different levels of test anxiety compared to upperclassmen? Test anxiety is when students frequently encounter distress or anxiety during testing situations. The students that commonly have it are high achieving and underprepared. What percentage are affected by it? Between 16 to 20% have high test anxiety levels and 18% have low to moderate. Participants, there were 99 participants from various colleges. Informed consent had a confidentiality agreement, which was voluntary and it also had the descriptions and procedures, risks and benefits. The demographic survey had six demographic questions, which included age, gender, ethnicity, whether the student is classified as lower classmen or upper classmen in their fall of 2019's GPA. The test anxiety scale was used to measure college students' test anxiety levels. The design was a quasi-experimental design which was used to examine the relationship between test anxiety and GPA. Figure one, class standing distribution. This was set into four groups, freshmen being 32%, sophomore being 13%, junior being 19%, and seniors being 36%. For figure two, it was also set into four groups for the age group distribution, 64% being between the age of 18 and 22, 23% being between the age of 23 and 26, and then 6% being the age between 27 and 30, and then 7% being 31 or above. Table one, class standing with GPA and test anxiety scores. There were 45 lower classmen with an average GPA of 3.12 and an average test anxiety score of 22.73. For upperclassmen, there were 54 with an average GPA of 3.23 and an average test anxiety score of 21.74. Lower classmen and upperclassmen have similar test anxiety levels. Table two, gender with GPA and test anxiety scores. There were 58 females with an average GPA of 3.27 and an average test anxiety score of 21.65. For males, there were 41 with an average, with an average GPA of 3.6 and an average test anxiety score of 22.95. Females and males both have high test anxiety levels. Analysis of research question. Pearson R correlation test was used to compare the relationship between test anxiety and GPA. R degrees of freedom 97 equals 0.26 and P is less than 0.05. This showed a positive weak relationship and was uh, considered accepted. The test anxiety scale, which was by uh, Erwin Saracen, ranges from low, medium, and high. Low is classified as 12 or below, medium is between 12 and 20, and high is considered 20 or above. The t-test compared the lower classmen scores of test anxiety to upper classmen scores of test anxiety. When the t-test was run 
at p is less than 0 0.05, results indicated that t degrees of freedom 97 equals 0 0.59 and p equals 1.66. The 0 0.59 is considered the t-score and then 1.66 is the critical value. And since the t-score is lower than the critical value, this was not significant. Hypothesis. Due to students encountering distress and test anxiety during testing situations, this led to the hypothesis that test anxiety impacts GPA. There was a significant relationship between test anxiety and GPA among college students and not a significant relationship between upperclassmen's test anxiety levels since two groups had similar test anxiety scores. Although both groups exhibited high test anxiety levels, therefore a large percentage of college students experienced test anxiety levels. All right. Limitations. Data collection was disrupted due to COVID-19 pandemic. An age group distribution was also limited within the participation pool. For future research, test anxiety and GPAs links to psychological needs of college students. And for future research, it's important to focus on the incoming freshmen's test anxiety levels to predict, um, to predict academic success. This will result in academic success, high graduation rate, and an increase in self-esteem. Do you guys have any comments or questions? <laughs> All right, thank you, Carly. If you have questions for Carly, if you will put them in the chat feature and then we will um, ask those for you. Uh, Carly, your first question, why did you choose to do this research? I chose to do this research because I actually deal with anxiety and test anxiety. So <laughs> that's kind of why I chose it because I actually deal with it on a regular basis. <laughs> okay, and next question. Um, have you differentiated between online testing and in-class tests? Um, I actually didn't uh, do that with, within this study. I didn't do the online and testing. All right. Any other questions for Carly? Another one coming in. <laughs> Can anxiety ever be a positive motivator? Well, if you're a high achieving student, it can, but if you're underprepared, definitely not. <laughs> like me, I'm considered high achieving. Like I really aim high in anything I do, but I deal with intense anxiety and anxiety every day, but I still have good grades because I work really hard for it. <laughs> All right, and one more, my, my timer's about to beep to tell you to stop doing your presentation. Okay. I, I saved that before all of you heard that. Um, another one, if test anxiety is so common in college campuses, what can colleges do to address this? Well, actually, that's, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually certain programs you can do, but I would recommend giving out the Saracen test anxiety scale, like when freshmen come in, I think it would be great for um, their overall academic success in the future. Because the, the test anxiety scale, there's 36 questions and it can determine what level of test anxiety a student has. And if they just handed that out to all the incoming freshmen, that'll benefit them in the future. All right, thank you. We have a few more minutes for questions. If I don't see one soon, we will, uh-oh, they're coming in, Carly. <laughs> no, no, You're I'm doing just doing well. It's okay. You're doing well. Ah, okay. uh, one more question. Is there a difference between test anxiety and fear of failure? Is there a difference? I think they kind of, they they relate for sure. I mean, Whenever you're dealing with uh, test anxiety, you fear a failure. You like literally forget during tests and everything else. Like you constantly feel that even with anxiety. So, I mean, I feel like they go hand in hand, if anything. You definitely fear a failure. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay. Without seeing any other questions. Stop sharing. Good morning. Thank you for coming to Scholar Day. My name is Devin Ponky, and I'm so excited to present to you my research on self-efficacy of first generation compared to second generation college students. 
I know many of you may not be familiar with this topic, so let me first start off by telling you my research question. The study's research question was, do first-generation college students have lower self-efficacy compared to second-generation students? First-generation students are those whose parents did not go to college, making them the first of their family or immediate family to attend college. And second-generation students are those whose parents did attend college and complete college. Self-efficacy can be defined as the belief in one's ability to succeed uh, in a situation or accomplish a task. The study uh, contained 72 full-time participants. They were all volunteer and there was no discrimination to gender or ethnicity. Participants first filled out an informed consent. It had information about the purpose, procedure, cost and benefit, any potential risk, and also have the contact information of myself, the researcher, and my supervisor, Dr. Gillen. Next, participants filled out a short demographic survey and asked for their gender, age, class level, ethnicity, and race. Following the demographic survey was one self-report question that asked students to identify if they were first or second generation college students. Students then filled out a self-efficacy assessment using the general self-efficacy scale by Gillen Chen and his team. This assessment was eight questions and you could answer using numbers one to five with one being strongly disagree and five being strongly agree. After participants filled out the two minute survey, they were thanked for giving the time out to complete uh, the survey for my research. If participants wanted to gain their results after the survey, they were able to create a unique four digit uh, PIN in the informed consent and later they were able to email me that PIN, giving me permission to access their results. Again, my research question was, do first generation college students have lower self-efficacy compared to second generation students? My hypothesis was that first generation college students would have lower self-efficacy compared to those of second generation students. But in fact, second generation college students have lower self-efficacy compared to first generation students. So my hypothesis was not supported. Although my hypothesis was not supported for my research, I find this very beneficial because um, it's actually a great thing that both first and second generation uh, college students have high levels of self-efficacy. Um, one clearly shows that there were more females than males. In fact, there were 53 females and 18 males. Figure two shows my race and mean scores of uh, the self-efficacy. As you can tell there, the majority were white participants, the minority uh, being made up of black, Hispanic, and others. Figure three shows my participant pool of age groups. I had a very diverse range of age from 18 to 26 plus. Figure four shows my age groups and their mean scores. Uh, it is very significant and uh, very clear to see that uh, age group 23 to 25 exhibited uh, much higher self-efficacy scores than those of the lower age. It could be said that uh, these students of higher age are more self-motivated in school. Uh, my research used a t-test assuming equal variance. It compared mean scores between first and second generation college students. My research found that there is no significant difference. The study found that while there is no correlation present, it did not meet the standard of statistical significance needed. In this case, it's a good thing that my hypothesis was not supported because this means that both first and second generation experience high scores of self-efficacy. However, I did run additional analysis on age groups and self-efficacy. It showed that the higher age groups, 23 plus, exhibited much higher self-efficacy. This could be said that older age groups can be seen as more self-motivated, focused, and dedicated than those of the younger age. A few limitations of my study was one being the coronavirus epidemic. 
This made all my surveys uh, be stricken to online only. This made a lack in my participant pool because I was not able to give random surveys, which made um, gender and ethnicity and race lack. Another limitation of my study was the general self-efficacy scale that I used. The numbers only range from one to five, making tests much more difficult to run when comparing significance. If I were to conduct future research on my research topic, I would focus more on males and the minority groups, as this is the uh, lack I had in my participant pool. I would also change my self-efficacy assessment to one with higher numbers, uh, a higher number range, so that my numbers could be tested more significantly. Thank you again for coming to Sunday. Hope you found my research topic interesting. And if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Devin. As we are checking the chat feature, um, first question is How do you define a high level of self efficacy? Uh, well, self efficacy is the ability and of oneself to a complete or accomplish a task. So I would say high self-efficacy is those that are motivated and have um, motivated or can complete a hard task to them, that like take the task and don't run from it, but actually complete it. Okay, next question. Do you think that males have the same level of self-efficacy as females in college? Um, I would say no, but my first, I would hypothesize as my answer to be no, um, just from the little bit of um, participants that, that I ran. But as you could see in my chart, that we lacked a lot of males and had so many um, number of males that as I concluded in my future research, I would test more males. Okay, third question. What made you choose this study, Devin? Um, I chose this study because I myself am a first generation college student and I always wanted to know like if that myth uh, or you usually hear that, you know, if your parents didn't go to college, you're less likely to, you know, finish college. I just wanted to, uh, I thought it was a great time to research that for this class. Okay, we have a few more minutes of questions for Devin. If anybody has any, we will get those in. Trying to see if anybody's typing. Well, Devin, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen on this. She did that in a hurry. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Devin. Appreciate your presentation. Uh, last for this first session is AJ Calhoun, presenter number 78, the participant ID number 78. Presentation topic is does parental marital status affect young adults attitude toward marriage? AJ? When you are ready, we will start your timer. Oh. Good morning, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Hope everybody's doing good. Um, today I'm going to talk on my topic that I did, uh, seeing uh, the parental marital status, uh, the effect on young adults and their attitude towards marriage. Um, I chose this topic solely based on the simple fact of a lot of people go through an experience of having a loved one or themselves uh, be affected by the divorce or the, the marriage within their parents' relationship. And uh, that has a big effect on your life and choices that you make, especially within your relationships. Um, I wanted to kind of find that connection uh, between young adults and their uh, attitude towards how they see their their parental uh, marital status, uh, how it affects their relationship in many ways uh, with other people. 
um, seeing how they go about handling different issues. Um, I know a lot of marriages uh, today, personally, end up in a divorce or a separation of some sort. And sometimes what can happen is that that kid or that young, that young adult that has to experience that gets left out. Their feelings don't get converted into a positivity type thing. It's always a negative thing. So I wanted to see, you know, if that really had a, a strong effect on a lot of these young adults relationships, um, especially in college when you're by yourself. Um, my my sample size uh, consisted of 72 college students, uh, some which were from LSU, a majority to be honest, which were from LSU. Um, I did collect about five that were from different colleges around the United States uh, that I were friends with. Uh, just to have a somewhat of a diversity with outside the southern states. Um, but my measurement, my assessment consisted of a 14-item uh, measurement scale called the Attitude Towards Marriage Scale. Um, it was a 1 through 5 uh, sort of Likert scale, 1 being uh, strongly disagree to 5, which was strongly agree. Um, answering those questions, some of those questions were a little iffy uh, for some participants and uh, they gave me feedback on that. And I, you know, I said, well, maybe next time we'll make some changes, try to come up, you know, see what we can do about that. Uh, better explaining to those students. Um, those students did, were able to uh, get into the assessment uh, they was able to ask those questions that that they didn't quite understand. So I kind of explained everything to them here and there uh, once they filled out their informed consent and everything. Um, but I kind of wanted to talk about how this topic can can have a few impacts uh, on the future, um, like our, our future commitment to marriage, uh, how we see marriage. Uh, will it lead to increase in, in divorce in the future, which was kind of why I wanted to do this to see what type of level uh, everybody was on and where they were at based on their attitude towards marriage. Um, my research question, like I said, was does marital status affect young adults' uh, attitude towards marriage? And I did hypothesize that there would be a significant difference uh, between the those students who were in a marriage, they would have a more positive attitude towards marriage than those students who went through a divorce or their parents were never married. And uh, I feel like that, that does play a significant difference as well in real life because those students who grow up in a single parent home, uh, things can be a lot harder than those who grow up in a, a marriage connected family who has both parents of inspiration and wisdom and uh, knowledge and information. It's hard for, I know for me, for my moms, it's hard for her to raise two boys, you know, without the dads being around. So I know that plays a big role as well. Um, but one big thing that I, that I had uh, when it came to my, my demographics, was seeing how many uh, students that I had that were married out of my population and how many uh, students were actually like in a relationship. That was a uh, big, 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 big thing. Cause here, if you can see uh, my little arrow over here, uh, blue represented, represented single, uh, red represented in a relationship and orange represented uh, married. And so of that 45.8%, uh, that's a, that was a big portion. That was 33 students in total that were in a relationship that, that this, this test here was basically kind of like a, a pathway for them to kind of see how they felt about their significant others, some questions that they, you know, never really thought about asking themselves and they had the chance here to answer how they felt about their significant other in that relationship. And so it gave an insight for them to be able to say, okay, here, this is, you know, this is what I need to look for in a relationship. This is what I feel like, you know, I would love for my significant other to, to be like, these are my, my mentality 
towards those things. Um, even for the married couples, they're already in that stage where, you know, from here, only things can either prosper or not prosper. And so, you know, that gave them an opportunity as well. But I did have a uh, a gap in between the, the gender with uh, only having 24 males, but I had 42 females. Um, DJ, you have you have one minute. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, but uh, the my young adults who were married, um, their parent who parents were married, uh, their positive attitude they had a, a score of eighteen point eighty, and those who had parents who were married but had a negative attitude had a 17.97. Um, those students who had a positive attitude, whose parents were divorced, had a 19.8 as well, with those who had a negative attitude toward divorce was a 22.75. Um, I also ran a uh, T-test of analysis of equal variance um, as well for my for my session, my assessment. Um, I did have some limitations with uh, the pandemic going on, but I was able to get a lot of people going and get them involved and to take in my survey. Um, I wish I could have more students from different universities, from different states to kind of get a bigger idea on uh, how people handle things. I know in the South, you know, religion is a big thing out here in the South as far as, you know, when you get married, you know, you try to stay married to death through us part. So I know that's that's one of those things that can play a, a factor as well. But I do say for future research, um, you know, looking at the, the timing of divorce as well, um, that also has an impact, especially on the development. If some of your family members, you know, your mom and dad, they get divorced, you know, while you're at a young age, you know, you kind of left with a lot of questions. Whenever you get older, you know, sometimes you might think it was your fault. So that could also have a automatic negative impact on how you see marriage. And, you know, you might get to that point where you're like, I don't want to put a kid through that situation. So you might not get married because of what you experience. Um, and so I also want to have a uh, bigger population of those students who are married, uh, you know, and I also want to have a bigger population of those students who had uh, more divorced parents and married parents. That way I can kind of get an equal uh, assessment of both of those uh, situations. All right. Thank you, AJ, for your presentation. If you have questions for AJ, if you will put them in the chat. We do have um, a couple questions. Yeah, I saw, I saw about five questions pop up before. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't look at the chat during your presentation. No, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> first question, did you find a significance between males and females? I did. Uh, there was a more positive attitude with females towards the marriage, um, I, which I kind of figured, uh, especially a lot of, a lot of guys kind of, tend to brush off uh, that effect that divorce can have on them. Um, they want to hide those emotions. For females, they're, they're able to express those emotions a lot well. So a lot of the attitude towards it uh, showed. But at the same time, like I said, I wanted to make sure I had a bigger population of those parents who were divorced and who were married, especially in the male and female. I had a lot more females than I had male. And majority of the males that I had had a parent who was uh, divorced. So they had more of a negative attitude than the females did based off of the, the population that I had and the statistics that I, that I had as well. All right, uh, next question is, did you find out whether the primary caregivers were male or female? No, I did not. Uh, get that far into into depth as whether the the caregivers were heterosexual homosexual whichever um i had, i know sometimes that that definitely has an impact as well i didn't when i was coming up with the questions i didn't want to be too broad and then i didn't want to be just too specific as well 
Um, I feel like that's one of those personal questions that a lot of people wouldn't really want to answer, especially, uh, you know, it could have an impact on them. Um, so, yeah, but that's that's something definitely that I would look forward to in the future is getting those people, you know, next time we do a study like this, definitely including that as well, just to see. Okay, next question. Uh, what, if any, were the ethical facets of your study? Um, majority of it was just uh, making sure not to, to overstep the boundary with the questions, um, making sure that uh, I was able to acknowledge like uh, the line between over asking and you know getting people out of their comfort zone. Um, uh, that's that's about all I got. I know that's Dr. Greg. I just finished editing. <laughs> uh, you know, he was gonna ask me an ethics, uh, ethical question. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, we've got another question or two. Um, next question: Did you write the scale that you used, or did you use one that was already published? I used one that was already published. Um, there's actually quite a few scales out there. Um, me and Dr. G. Uh, looked at the original scale that they had, but some of the questions were a little off. So I ended up uh, using a scale that was used in a master's program uh, paper as well, uh, that I felt like would be a little bit more simplified for uh, students to use based on uh, being able to answer them effectively. I did, like I said, I did have some students who kind of like, well, I feel like this question could be reworded a little different which I totally agreed, uh, which is why I'm like, you know, maybe one day I can, you know, do my own little thing when I go through the math and whatnot, <laughs> make it a little easy. All right, and last question, we've got just a, a quick response for you on this one. What do you consider the best part of doing your study? Um, the best part about doing my study was, was seeing how many seeing the questions and seeing some of the answers that I got for the questions. Um, you know, some people, you know, really was kind of just like on edge about their relationships. Like I didn't know personally who they were, but just seeing some of the questions and I was like, oh man, I was like, man, we, uh, <laughs> we're not looking too good with some of the responses. But, you know, at the same time, I was also pretty proud because our generation is a generation that's, that's starting next, you know, so we got to be able to, keep that keep that role of saying, look, our vows say to death do us part. And so, you know, we gotta figure out who we are and we gotta figure out who the person we plan on spending the rest of our life with are or is. And, you know, just enjoying those times and moments together, you know, ask questions that you would never ask, you know, you never ask and you'll find a lot of answers that you would never think that you could get. And that's a lot of what I got uh looking at some of the responses as well to my my assessment. All right. Thank you, AJ, for your presentation. And Maddie and Carly and Devin as well did a nice job. This concludes session one for, um, for the presentations. We will be back in nine minutes.